Hi, and welcome to the Victory Church Podcast. We're so glad you could join us. If this ministry has impacted you in any way, we'd love to hear all about it. Please send us an email at share at victorychurchatl.org. We pray this message will speak to your heart. If you are a guest, you're watching right now on YouTube, your phone, podcast, wherever you are, your car, you're listening while you're driving, we welcome you to Victory, we welcome you to our 1130 gathering, and we welcome you to week three of a very important series called Unmask, Finding Healing and Transparency. I am convinced through my study of the scriptures and my own personal testimony that there is a powerful, powerful release of healing and strength and freedom found in biblical and wise transparency. I believe God has called us to practice this ethic straight through the writings of James, who wrote the very first letter to the Christian church, where he said we could practice the ongoing ethic of confession prayer that leads to healing, transparency. In this message, I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of scriptures for the purpose of helping you lean your heart into a truth I want you to grab hold to in this message. And I believe that if you grab hold of this truth, it's going to be a blessing to you. In week one, we started this series with a message called Unmasked. We talked about the power of transparency. Last week, I preached a message to you called Being Transparent with Self, where transparency must begin. I want to talk to you this morning about transparency with God. Probably the most difficult, uh, uh, but this one is meant to be the most encouraging of the four messages. So our Heavenly Father, you who are good and present, would you minister to the hearts of we, your sons and daughters, your children. Give us a greater revelation of your person. May we leave here a little bit closer to you than we are right now pray that for those in this room, I pray that for the person watching, the person driving and listening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Transparency with God. About three years ago, I was sitting at my kitchen table with my son Malachi. It was late, probably after 11 o'clock p.m., We was having a conversation because I had noticed that he had been coming home from school visibly disturbed and angry all the time. And so I was digging into his heart trying to find out the source of that anger and his frustration. Why is it my son, who I've known to be calm and docile, keeps coming home from school angry and frustrated every single day? And as a loving parent, I was trying to dig into the depths of his heart. We as parents should try to do that with our children. They are human beings with emotions and feelings. It was during the course of that conversation I learned from my son Malachi that he had been battling a very tenuous issue with another brother at his school, and this had been going on for about a year. And I said to Malachi when I was sitting at the table, I said, son, Why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you come to me, come to your mother and tell us what was going on? And his response to me was was so indicative of some of the, the responses that we give to God in this room. His response to me was like, well, Daddy, I wasn't sure if you would really care about this. I wasn't sure what your response would, would be if I told you. And I wasn't sure how you would feel about me if I told you what I was dealing with this year at school. And so I, I just kind of kept it to myself. And he wasn't, he wasn't not being transparent out of being disrespectful or dishonorable, but he wasn't being transparent with his father out of fear for how I may respond and for maybe feeling ashamed or battling with something and not knowing how to express it to his father. I said, okay, son, I totally understand. And I sent him to bed, and I stayed there at the kitchen table, and I just wept. And I'm weeping because I'm thinking to myself, I as a, am a loving father. I'm thinking to myself, my son, who I love, have been battling this in school for a whole year, and I never knew. And I'm crying because I'm thinking to myself, had he only come to me and told me what he was dealing with, I would have entered into that suffering with him. 
and where he misinterpreted my response that I would be harsh and judgmental, he did not realize that I would have entered into that suffering with love and compassion. And I would have helped him in the middle of that suffering. So for a whole year, he was a silent sufferer in an issue that could have been easily resolved had he just been transparent to tell me what he was dealing with. And so as a loving father, I felt denied the opportunity for the invite of transparency into his problems. And so I sat there and just continued to weep over my own brokenness out of my deep love and adoration and affection for my son. My question is to you, I wonder right now, how much tears is God shedding over sons and daughters in this room? I wonder how many sons and daughters are silent sufferers and struggling with transparency with their father. Struggling to be intimate with their father. Struggling to talk to their father. And I wonder how many of us right now have been the objects of his tears and his affection because he has not found an invite into our issues. We have blocked them out by the lack of our transparency. If we would be honest, many of us are like this, this way with our Heavenly Father. Our struggles with transparency with God is so a part of the human experience and human nature. And the question is, where did this come from? Where did this begin? Why is it so many of us sitting in this room struggle so often with being transparent and intimate with God? Why do we struggle to tell him what's really on our heart, what's really going on in the depths of our soul? Where did that struggle originate from? A man named Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recorded for us what we call the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. In the first book of the Bible, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses recorded for us the book of origins, the book of beginnings, It tells us where all of this got started. In Genesis, Moses wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that a God who stepped out on nothing spoke a world into being. He fashioned that world by the breath of his lungs and then created a perfect life support system called Earth. After he had created animals and trees and a beautiful palatial estate he called the Garden of Eden that he placed eastward in a particular place, He created from the dust of the ground human, humus, which means dirt or dust, created a humus, a man, and breathed into him the breath of life, and that man became a living soul. He looked at that man and said it was not good for that brother to be alone, and so he pulled a rib from the side of that brother while he was asleep. Consequently, your rib is the only bone in your body that if removed, it can grow back again on its own. God was so wise, he wanted to make sure that he would leave a fingerprint on the inside of his creation. And so the rib could be removed and it would completely regenerate on its own. The only bone in your body that can absolutely do that. He puts a man to sleep, pulls out a rib, he creates for him Lena. (laughs) Philip wakes up from his sleep, he says, this is bone of my bone. And flesh of my flesh. And the scripture says, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his pineapples. (laughs) And the two shall become one flesh. And then Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, ends with these words. It says, then the man and his wife was both naked and they felt no shame. No need for clothes, no need for barriers. No need for lingerie or any of that stuff. They were both naked and they felt no shame. They had intimacy with God, intimacy with each other. They were in perfect harmony with their father until Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, Moses records the entering into that garden of Satan who had been in the world before man was created. According to Jesus, Satan was kicked out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning down to the earth. And he was there in the garden when Adam and Eve got there and came to them in the form of an upright serpent with hands and feet and communication and speech. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see a a collapse, a breach of the intimacy between God and men. It is the origin of all human suffering. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 begins like this. Now the serpent was more crafty 
than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Because God had given Adam instructions. You have everything in the garden. You can eat. Everything in here belongs to you. There are two trees in the center of the garden. Do not touch them. One is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The other one is the tree of life. Those two things don't touch. Now Satan comes to Eve and he says to her, did God really say you can't touch those two trees? The woman says, he says, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will surely die. First mistake, she's having a conversation with the adversary. I want to remind all of us who like to say the devil is beneath me and we talk bad about this. Let me just remind you of what the scripture says. He was a chief cherub in heaven, one of three archangels. He is wise and crafty and not stupid. When we see in Matthew chapter 4, the devil comes to do the same thing to Jesus. Notice Jesus does not have a conversation with the devil. Instead, he quotes the scriptures to him three times, he says. It is written one, it is written two, it is written three. So all he does, Satan talks to Jesus, Jesus quotes the word. Satan talks to Jesus, Jesus quotes the word. Satan talks to Jesus, Jesus quotes the word. Satan talks to Eve, she gets confused. Verse 4, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So now he deceives her with a half lie and a half truth because the best lie is not a whole lie. The best lie is a little bit of truth mingled with a little bit of lie. That is the best deception. And so now he tricks her and says, nah, you won't, God is just trying to keep, no, you will be just like God if you touch this. This is what he's talking So Eve says, wait, if I touch the tree, I can be like God? The first sin of idolatry. I want to be just like God. Nothing wrong with trying to be like God, but trying to go your own route to be like him is idolatry, Eve. But also notice who the serpent is talking to. When God created Adam, he gave him instructions. He spoke to him about spiritual instructions, but the serpent does not come to Adam. The serpent comes to Eve. So he comes to the one that did not get the original instructions from God, i.e., he comes to the weaker vessel in the marriage. So his attempt to dismantle the marriage is his attack on the weaker vessel, i.e., the stronger vessel in the marriage. Hello, we should be praying and trying to protect our weaker vessels. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Pause. So in this text, I don't have time to bother this text completely because there is a whole sermon in this text. But suffice it to say, because I'm a loving pastor, I got to drop a few gems on you on this text because there's a whole series in this text. I want you to see the progress of sin. She saw, she took, she ate, she gave. That's the process of sin. We see, we take, we consume, we share. That's right. We get tempted by what we see. We take what we see. We consume what we see. We say, come join me in this sin. But I also want you to notice the scripture says who was with her when the serpent was talking to her. It says her husband was standing right there. That means he had been listening to the conversation the whole time. That means he stood there and let his wife be beguiled by the devil. The first sin of man was not the fall. The first sin of man was passivity. To not protect his wife and his home from the adversary. That God has called us men to be protectors of our homes. And one of the greatest sins of man is passivity. No action. No movement. So he allowed his home to be destroyed while he sat on the couch and watched sports all day. He let his home be destroyed by a devil. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, so now they fell into sin. Now they adopted a new nature. I'm teaching. 
and they realized they were naked, something they did not know before. Okay? So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, the next verse is critically important. Watch the next verse carefully. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. So now God is coming in to do what he normally does. I'm just trying to have fellowship with my son and my daughter. We have been doing this all this time before, but now something is different. Now, instead of coming to me, now they're running from me. Now, instead of hiding or being with me, now they're hiding from me. Now, our intimacy is broken by your knowledge of your shame. And they're hiding from God. The next verse is a bombshell. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and he says, where are you? Pause. Pause. You can't just read by that. There is a theological bombshell in this verse. The Lord God called to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? Pause. If we understand the scripture, we know that God is all-knowing, which means there is no ambiguity with sovereignty. So the divine sovereign who knows all things is shouting to a man, where are you? If there's no ambiguity with sovereignty, then God is not asking him for his location because he already knows where Adam is when he asked him, where are you? So this question is less of, Adam, where are you physically? But it's more of, Adam, why are you hiding from me? It's not like his hiding spot was so dope behind a tree that God couldn't find him. God knows all things. So watch. The question really is, Adam, why are you hiding from the being that knows all things? Why are you trying to cover what I already know? Why instead of running to me, you run away from me? Why we're no longer transparent and intimate with each other? So this is less about location and more about his heart. Because there is no ambiguity with sovereignty. Because God knows all things. Side note is just like the scripture says, God cannot change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You know why God can't change? Because if you can change, that means you could get better. And God can't change because he can't get better. And God can't get better because he's perfect. That's why he can't change. He can't grow. He can't learn because he knows everything. We can change. That means we could get better. He can't change because he's already perfect. We can learn because we don't know all things. He can't learn because he knows all things. So there's no ambiguity with sorrow. So he's not trying to figure out what Adam is. He's just trying to figure out what happened to our transparency. Watch his response, verse 10. And Adam answered and said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. Here is the breach of transparency. The first breach of transparency with God was watch fear of how the Lord would respond, watch, to my humanity. Watch. So he was loving enough to give me all of this, and then if I fail, he he wasn't loving enough to wrap his arms around me in my failure. So I, I heard you, God, and instead of running to you, I ran away from you. The first breach of transparency with God. The question, Adam, where are you, was an invite into transparency. It was an opportunity for Adam to tell him, watch, I messed up. Adam doesn't say that. He just said, I was afraid, and so I ran. He doesn't tell him, I messed up. The question, where are you, was an invite into transparency. Verse 11, and I said, God said to him, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Watch, God already knows he ate from that tree. So he's not asking him for information. This is a second invite into transparency. Why? Because there is no ambiguity with sovereignty. He already knows he ate. He already knows he fell. So he's not asking him because he needs the knowledge. 
He's asking them because he's giving them an invite to come out from the heavy burden of your mistake. Man, you're preaching, Philip. He's asking him to give him an opportunity to come out from underneath the heavy burden of his mistake. Adam, tell me, what did you do? Be transparent with me, my son. How does Adam respond? The next verse. Uh, it was the woman you put here. She gave me some of the fruit to eat. So instead of taking ownership for my wrong and just being transparent, let me, let me shift the blame. Let me punt and shift the blame to God is the woman you gave me. Well, what happened to bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? She was good enough to lay down with. They don't want me to go here. She, she was good enough to lay down with. She was bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But as soon as God is talking to you about your problem, it's her fault now. The, it's, it's, the whole marriage is your fault. Everything is wrong. But it, where is ownership? See? His perception was ownership would get him in trouble. His perception was ownership would get him in trouble is why he was afraid. He did not think that ownership might find him grace. For those of us who have parents and have children, you ask them about something you know they did. You know they did this. You came home, you see something out of place, you know they did it, and then just ask them just to test them. Did you do this? And you know what, you're, you're looking for two roads. If they'll be transparent, they might find grace. If they lie, I'm going to have to deal with them. Where are my parents at? You, you have already chosen two options. If they be honest, they might get grace. If they lie, I'm going to have to deal with them. Watch. Next verse. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? He already knows what she did. He gives her an opportunity to be transparent. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Not, Lord, I disobeyed you, and I ate. See, this is partial transparency. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Not, Lord, I disobeyed you, and I ate. So Adam was not transparent or honest. Eve was not transparent, and then we go on to find out their punishment. For the serpent, you lose all your body parts, you'll be on your belly the rest of your life. For the woman, in pain, you will bring forth children. Y'all know that's true. And for the man, for the rest of your life, you will work hard to earn your labor. No more blessing of palatial estate. Now you will work a nine to five to bring home that bacon. That was the punishment. And what we see here is, watch, the breakdown, the first breakdown of transparency between God and men. The first breakdown between intimacy of God and men. And the effect of that sin nature in us now is now we all have a natural bent to shy away from deep transparency with God. It's just in our nature to not want to always be honest with God, especially when we feel that conviction or we feel that weight of sin. For many of us, as a response to that, we just default to shallow prayers or surface prayers if we pray at all. We might pray and talk to him, but because we know we're in a bad state, we won't really be fully transparent because we're nervous because of his holy nature. And for other of us, we just default to carrying our griefs. Watch. We know we did wrong or we're going through some trial, and we'll just carry that because we have a misconception about how God might respond. In addition to our sin nature, I believe that often life fosters different challenges to transparency between human beings with God. I want to just run off a couple at you that I see in the lives of human beings. First, uh, misconceptions of God's revealed nature as seen in Jesus. That is, there's a lot of us, we see God as angry, vengeful, wrathful, spiteful, and because we have a misconception about his nature, it's hard for us to be transparent with him. The scripture says, Jesus said, if anyone has seen me, they have seen the Father. And so if we want to know the character of the Father you serve today, all you have to look at is the character of Jesus. What do we see in Jesus? He's loving. He's kind. He's gracious. He's patient. He's forgiving. He's slow to anger. He's rich in mercy. He finds people caught in adultery and said, where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. 
He sees a woman in sin breaking oil over his feet, and he says what she has done will be told forever for the endless ages of eternity. We see that he loves children. He's a friend of sinners. His only problem was with religious people. Another barrier to intimacy with God is father wounds that distort our persona of who God is. Some of us, when we hear the word father, we think abandonment. When we hear the word father, we think absent. When we hear the word father, we think rejection. When we hear the word father, we think work too much, sacrifice me on the altar of career. When we hear the word father, we think gone. We think when we hear the word father, we think never talk, never had a conversation. When we hear the word father, we think sexual abuse. When we hear the word father, we think violent. When we hear the word father, we think chose a drug over me. So when we hear the word father, it stirs up in some of us a kind of negative connotation that because of that, it's hard sometimes for us to connect with God as a father. That's why the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 makes this comparison between earthly fathers and a heavenly father, that the better our heavenly father is, the more it helps us to understand what our earthly father is supposed to be like. So some of us, we don't even know the feeling of sitting on a daddy's lap and just telling him what's in our heart. We don't know what it feels like to be intimate with a male figure in our home or in our life. Another barrier to intimacy with God or transparency is our trust issues with God, his person and his intention. Some of us, if we would be honest, we don't trust God. We are afraid that if we told him what we really felt, he might strike us, he might make us a nun, he might send us to some country we don't want to go to. We're afraid if we told him how we really felt, he would respond to us in a way that we don't trust his intentions. We don't believe that he has our best interests at heart. Another intimacy or another barrier to transparency is our struggles with intimacy and prayer. Some of us knows what it feels like. We'll rattle off a quick two minute in prayer. We spend all of our life in that three feet side of the pool, but we never get into that deep side of the pool where the waters are covering us from the glory of God in prayer that we're swimming deep into the intimacies of who he is. Another struggle to, to our transparency with God is our struggles with being runners. Some of us knows what this feels like. We are runners from God. Man, anytime we start feeling like God is getting too close to our heart, man, we run. We run. We, we run from fellowship that make us confront who we are. We run from churches that make us confront who we are. We run from mentors. Anytime we feel like God is getting too close to some area, we put a wall around, man, we just start running from God altogether. Another barrier I've seen, this one is huge, our struggles with poor self-image. There's so many people in this room, so many people watching, man. Listen, we have such poor self-image. I know what it is to struggle with this. We feel so unworthy. We feel like we've made so much mistakes. We feel like we have out God's grace. Well, listen, we deal with some failures, some shame from the past, and because of poor self-image, we feel like God won't even listen to what I have to tell him. I know he don't want to hear what I have to say. There is no way God will listen, watch, to a person like me. Another struggle is struggle with being burden carriers. That we, man, we be dealing with heavy things and we don't think that we could release that to God. And so watch, we try to carry all of our pressures on ourselves. Another one is struggles with unforgiveness is a barrier to transparency. Some of us, I know this one is tough. Man, we are holding people in our heart and as a result of that, we can't even feel transparency or intimacy with God. How can you? Jesus said, man, if you don't forgive other people their sin, you will not feel peace. He says a person will be tormented who does not forgive. So let me say to somebody, let me just, this is a whole other message. Let me help somebody in this room. Forgiveness is never for the person that offended you. Amen. They can never give you back your tears. They can never give you back the time that you lost. They can never give you back the knife that they put in your back. They can never give you that back. But when you forgive somebody, you give yourself the gift of peace. You give yourself the gift of freedom. You give yourself the gift of sleep. And for those who feel like, man, I have a right to hold on to this person, I ask you a question that a counselor asked me many, many years ago. Is the blood of Jesus enough to pay for what they have done for you? Is the cross of Calvary enough to pay for what they have done for you? Is what Jesus did on the cross strong enough to absorb the sin that they committed against you? You can never get back those tears. You will never get back those years. You will never get back your virginity. You will never get back your innocence. But is the cross of Christ enough to pay for what they did? To say the blood of Jesus is not enough to pay for that offense is to say my right to, 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 
to hold a person is almost an offense against the cross. Lord, your blood was not strong enough to pay for that offense. Let me help everybody, doctor. It's not the blood plus anything. For the apostle Paul says, man, it's not faith plus anything. It's faith and in Christ and that alone. Sola fide. Right? And so I want to help somebody in this room who says, man, I have a right to hold this person because what I've done, man, remember was your Lord hanging on a cross who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's not because they deserve it. It's because you deserve freedom. You deserve to sleep. Somebody, you're going to sleep good tonight. Right? You're going to sleep good tonight. And let me just remind somebody, forgiveness does not mean you go back into the relationship. Sometimes we got to learn distance forgiveness. I forgive you, but watch, because forgiveness is a grace gift. Access must be earned. Help us, Philip. Help us, Philip. Sometimes we forgive people and put them back in a place they do not belong. So they got to burn you over and over and over until you realize they don't have the character to handle intimacy. They're not listening to this, Don. You don't have the character for access. So love is a grace gift. Forgiveness is a grace gift. Access must be earned through character, trust, and loyalty. You don't have a right to access, but you do have a right to forgiveness. You don't have a right to access, but you do have a right to love. So I might forgive you, but it might change the nature of our relationship forever. Another struggle of transparency, man, is our struggles with overt and unseen pride. That when we are prideful, it's hard to be transparent with God. And the risk, listen to me, of us not being transparent with God, the risk of doing that is sometimes we'll deal with dysfunction longer than we have to. We'll deal with unhealthy mindsets and unhealthy emotions longer than we have to. We'll be stuck in cycles of brokenness longer than we have to. Man, we risk God leaning into that pain, not knowing that all he wants to do is come in and love you, comfort you, help you. But because of our fear of being completely transparent with God, man, we stay stuck in things longer than we have to. All the while, he's just waiting for an invite into that problem. I want to tell you something that may shock some of you. Here it is. God delights in the bearing of your soul in transparency and humility and dependency upon him. And some of us, man, look, this revelation transformed my life when I got this many, many years ago. God, he delights in the bearing of your soul and transparency, humility, and dependency upon him. He delights in that. He finds joy in when the creation is dependent upon the creator. And so when we bear our soul before him in humility and dependency, when we're crying out to God, he finds delight in our bearing of our soul before him and our dependency dependency upon them. Man, when we're crying out to God about our emotions, about our worries, about our anxieties, our fears, our needs, our questions, God, I'm coming to you because you are my safe place. You are my strong tower. When we're bearing our soul before him, he finds delight in that. He finds delight in that. And I know many of us, man, we struggle with being transparent in prayer. We think we know what God wants to hear, so we'd be afraid to be honest with him. We think if I say this, he will respond. No, 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 no. You want me to tell you what God wants from you in terms of transparency? Well, this, is, this is what he wants from you. He, he wants this right here. He wants, he wants Father... Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, I, I pray you will see my marriage, God. I'm so frustrated in my marriage, God. I'm frustrated with my spouse, God. They don't understand me. They don't listen to me, God. They abuse me. They don't validate my words, God. God, she, she doesn't respect me. She doesn't honor me like the man I'm supposed to be. I just want to leave. I want to get out, God. I'm so angry. I'm so, oh, Father, look, look at my husband, God. He doesn't validate me. He doesn't love me. He only wants to have sex with me. He doesn't listen to me. He always shuts me down, God. He, dis, he dishonors me. I just want to divorce. I made a mistake. I should have never got married. Oh, Father, I know you keep telling me stop hopping in and out of these beds, but I can't stop, God, Lord. When I lay down, I feel love. When he's in me, I feel like he's loving me, God. I know it's wrong, but it feels so right, God. I don't know what to do, God. I know when I get up from the bed, I'm crying. I know you can't stand when I do this, God, but Lord, it just feels so right. I don't know what love feels like. I need this from you. Oh, Father, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill, God. I'm not sure if I can ask you for money. Can I trust you to help me pay this, God? Oh, God, these children. I don't know how to parent them, God. I need wisdom, Lord. I can't stand them. They're they, they, they messing up my life. I didn't want them, God. I don't know what to do. This is what he wants from you. Honesty in prayer. 
Lord, I'm hurting, Lord. I'm battling insecurities, Lord. I'm afraid. I'm battling insecurities. God, I don't love myself. I only feel pretty when I got on my makeup. They told me I was not pretty. They called me ugly when I was young. God, I don't love myself. I know you told me I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but I don't believe it. I have doubt, God. I have unbelief. But help me, my unbelief. I don't believe you. I know you would do it for them, but I don't think you would do it for me. God, I don't feel deserving. I feel unworthy. This is what he wants from you. What is the point of wearing a mask before the one that knows you completely? And some of us are so afraid to pray that way and not knowing that that is the pathway to release. That is a pathway to healing, it's a pathway to freedom. And we think if we pray that way, we're wrong. So I want to help unburden you. I want to show you that it's not crazy to pray that way. I want to show you four prayers recorded in this book, and one of them is really graphic. You're welcome, daughter. And one of them is really graphic, to unburden you to say it's okay to tell him exactly how you feel. How about, how about when you want something from him? And you're talking about, oh, God, bless me with what? Um, I just want blessing with what? We're so afraid to actually say, this is what my heart desires. Let me show you four powerful prayers. One of them is really graphic. The first one comes from 1 Samuel, the prayer of a woman named Hannah. There was a certain man from Ramatha, a Zebuphite, in the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. He was the son of all these people. Verse 2, he had two wives. One was called Hannah, the other Panina. Panina had children. Hannah had none. Verse 3, year after year, the man went up to his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord God Almighty at Shiloh with Ophna and Phinehas, who the two sons of Eli, they were priests of the Lord. Verse 4, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, watch, he would give portions of meat to his wife Panina and all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. But the Lord had closed her womb. Because some of the things we're dealing with is not the devil. Everything is not the devil. We give him too much credit. Everything is not the devil. It was God who closed her womb. Why? Because sometimes he'll break us to get glory out of our story. Somebody say, God, get glory out of my story. There's purpose in pain. Can I continue? Verse 6, and because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her to irritate her. This went on year after year after year after year. When Hannah, whenever she went up to the house of the Lord, her rival would provoke her until she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, I like this part, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Watch the next few verses. Once when she had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting there on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. I like verse 10. In bitterness. In bitterness of what? Of soul. What did Hannah do? Hannah wept much and prayed before the Lord God. And she made this vow to the Lord. Oh, Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me. God, see my, see my issue and remember me, oh God. And then watch what she says next. She says, and not forget your servant and give her a son. Not, Lord, bless me with a child. No, 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 no. What do you really want? Well, I want a boy. Give me a son. That's as transparent as you can get. Man, I don't just want a child. I want a boy. Yeah. It was these prayers my wife and I prayed that gave us Josiah. Because we had a boy and we had two girls and my wife wanted an even team. And so we didn't just say, God, give us another child. We put our hands on this and we said, God, give us a son. Jesus. And God sent Josiah. It's how we got the two-on-two, two, two boys and two girls. And my wife said, we done now. <laughs> when the doctors told my mother she had a damaged cervix and you would never have children, she laid her hands on this prayer and said, God, give me a son. And if you give me a son, I will give him back to you to do your work, Lord. She didn't just say, open my womb. I want a boy.
Then I'll give them back to you. Verse 12. I like this part. As she kept praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying with her heart. Her lips were moving, but no voice was heard. Eli thought she was drunk. He said to her, how long will you keep getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. And I like the next verse. Not so, my Lord. Hannah replied, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul before the Lord. I was pouring out my soul before the Lord. Now, that ain't strong enough for y'all. How about I get more graphic than that? How about a man who was angry because his friend betrayed him? And said, oh, Lord, uh, bless them. No. How, how, how did David pray when he was angry because he was betrayed and he was hurting? This is too graphic for some of y'all. I know you didn't think this was in the Bible. Psalm 109. Oh God, whom I praise, do not remain silent, for the wicked and deceitful men have opened up their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues on social media. How's this for a prayer? With words of hatred, they surrounded me. They attacked me with their words without cause. They lied in their posts. In return for my friendship, they accused me. But I am a man of prayer. Yeah. And then how does he pray? Oh, Lord, bless them. Nah, that's not how David prayed. This is transparency. Why? Because he's angry and he's hurt. So he's just getting it off his chest. You're going to be shocked. It don't get no roar than this. Verse 5. They repay me evil for good and the hatred for my faint trip. Verse 6. Appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tired or when he's tried, let him be found guilty. And may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. That is, kill him early. May another man take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife be a widow. Let his, let his family suffer because of his evil. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven out to ruin from homes. May his creditor, everybody he owes money, come and take everything they have from him, God. Verse 12, may no one extend kindness to him. May nobody take pity on him. May his descendants be cut off. May their names be blotted out. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. Verse 15. May their sins always remain before the Lord. That is, God never forget what he did. Verse 16. For he never thought of doing kindness, but hounded to death the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted. Verse 17. He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come back on him. He loved to talk trash. May it come back on him. He found no pleasure in blessing. Let it come back in him. Verse 18. He was cursing with his garments. It returned to his body like water and his bones like oil. Verse 19. May it be like a cloak wrapped around him. May he never escape what he said. Verse 20. May this be the Lord's payment to my accusers, to the ones who speak evil of me. How's that for transparency in prayer? You know what David is doing? I'm angry. I'm hurt. I feel betrayed. I feel bruised. I'm going to get it off my chest. You know what that is? That's freedom. Yeah. But watch how David goes next. Um, Lord, after you crush them, verse 21, but oh Lord, sovereign Lord, deal with me for your namesake out of goodness and love. Deliver me. Hurt them, but deliver me for I am poor and I am needy. My heart is wounded within me. I fade away like an evening shadow. I am shaken like the locust. My knees are given away because I've been fasting before you, Lord. Verse 25, I am the object of scorn of my accusers. When they see me, they shake their heads at me. Verse 26, oh, help me, oh, Lord God. Save me in accordance to your love. Verse 27, let them know that it was your hand that did this, oh, Lord. Now watch. Now God may not answer any of that. But watch, he got that off his chest. That ain't raw enough for you. How about the prayer of a person battling depression and suicide? How about that? How about that? How, does, how did a person who was suicidal pray? A son of Korah who was suicidal and depressed. Verse 88, Psalm 88. Oh, Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry before you. I'm just trying to show you what transparency looks like. May my prayer come before you and your heir to my cry. Watch this. For my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near to the grave. This is I feel suicidal. I've been here twice in my life. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead. Like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from care. You have put me in the lowest part. So now watch. I'm blaming you, God, for how I feel. How was that for transparency? 
Some of y'all have been mad at God and you won't even get that off your chest. Like, God, I feel this is your fault. He can handle that. Yeah. It's better for you to say that than be bottled up on the inside. Yeah. Verse 7, Shantis. Your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all of your ways. You have taken from me the closest friends. I blame you for the death of the person who died. And you have been repulsive to them. I am confined and I cannot escape. Verse 9, my eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. Do not show wonders or to the dead. Do those dry. Do those in dead rise up and praise you? Is your love delivered in the grave or declared in the grave? Your faithful destroy. Are you, are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Or your righteous deeds to the land of the oblivion? Verse 13, but I cry out to you for help, O my Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes up before you. I am depressed, I'm suicidal, but I'm crying out to you for help. Well, how about one more? How about a man who commits adultery, kills the husband of the woman, and then takes her for his wife? How about that? How about that, David? How about, how about trying to hide that for nine months before you're confronted by a prophet who says, David, you're the man who did this. Now, how, what you're going to do now, David? You're going to keep running from God, or you're going to be transparent? How does David respond to his sin? I love this, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your great company, this is how a person who's guilty prays with transparency. I'm not even going to front God. I did it. Have mercy on me. According to your unfailing love, according to your compassion, blot out all my transgression. I love verse 2. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Let me not hide. I love the next verse. For I know my transgressions. I know my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. I've done what was evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you rebuke the hell out of me. Yeah. Verse 5, Shantis. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost parts. I love verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. God, after you have done all of that, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you crushed inside me, let it rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. God, I don't even want you to remember what I did. Blot out my iniquity. Do you pray like that when you sin? Some of you sin and don't go to him. Verse 10, I pray this over my life every day. Every day, create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit with me. That is, you know, give me that vitality again. Give me that strength again. I've been feeling ashamed about this for so long, but make me alive again. Do not cast me from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And I love verse 10. Then after you do all that, you know, I will take the lesson I learned from messing up, and I'm going to teach other people how to be better. Bearing your soul before the Lord. How many of us pray like that? And for what it's worth, when you start to pray with that level of transparency and honesty, when you start to talk to God with that level of transparency, you know what you're going to find? Freedom. Release. You're going to have a chance to vent. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? I'll give you three powerful steps of wisdom, and I'll pray for you. How do you begin to just be transparent with God, your heavenly Father? Number one, you should pray with unfiltered. Humility. Do that. Pray with unfiltered. Just, just be honest. Pray with unfiltered honesty. I love how Jesus said, he said, it don't make no sense to come before God with all your fancy speech. He, watch this, because he already knows. Just come and tell him, I'm hurt. My insecurity is crippling me. I feel angry. Watch this, how about I'm tired? Just pray with unfiltered honesty. Number two, you should write with non-judgmental clarity. 
these things have changed my life. That is, watch this. When you don't know how to pray, grab a piece of pen and a piece of paper and just write. I've kept a journal for almost 16 years. And if you read my journal, you would be shocked. You will see pages of highs, pages of lows, pages of anger, pages of compassion, pages of vengeance, pages of all kinds. And I just pour out my, and and whatever I'm feeling, that's what I write. I'm not going to try to fix that. I'm angry today. I'm mad today. I feel vulnerable today. I want something and you didn't come through for me today, God. I'm, I'm crying as I'm writing, Lord. And you go back on that and you look at, this is where I was last year. I can't believe he brought me that far. And the last one, I've done this well. You should cry with unrestrained humility. That is when I can't pray and I can't write, just weep. Just cry. You feel ashamed? Just cry. You feel like you failed him? Just cry. You feel like you have a need and you don't think he's going to come through? Just cry. Your tears are liquid prayers and he can respond to those. Your tears have a voice. Just cry. Why? We should learn to don't sanitize your prayers, don't sanitize your journal, and don't sanitize your tears. Don't try to clean them up. Don't try to sanitize them and make them cute before the Lord. Just bear your soul before him. Be transparent. Be honest. Be open. Start talking to him about everything. During every anxiety, every worry, every shame, every need, every question. Just turn it into an honest prayer. You know what you're going to find as you live that way? You're going to find constant release. You're going to find strength. You're going to find freedom. Let me tell you another thing some of y'all are going to find that you don't even realize. You're going to find grace. You're going to find comfort. You're going to find that the God you thought that would smite you in your prayer is the God that will actually let you cry and get off your chest and that he will turn those tears of sorrow into tears of joy as you feel his loving presence wrapping you in his arms. Sometimes you could just sit down in his presence, Indian style or whatever the case may be, and and act like you're looking across from him and just like you're staring into his eyes or even in shame put your head down and just tell him what's on your heart. We do a good job sanitizing, masking, covering up. Watch. Wait, look, look. Let me, let me finish with this thought. Imagine that the God who knows you completely and loves you unconditionally is the one that's giving you the invite into transparency. They miss that. Watch. He loves you unconditionally. Watch this. And at the same time knows you completely. So you have no broken areas he don't know. Why mask? You have no failure he does not know. Why mask? You have no insecurity, no anxiety, no desire that he does not know. Why Why cover up before the person that knows everything? My son, my daughter, where are you? Don't run from me. running to me why because the Lord is gracious slow to anger abounding in mercy I love what the scripture says he's a strong tower the righteous run into him and find safety I love how the scripture says that he hides us under the shadow of his wings I love how the scripture says he leads us into paths of righteousness for his namesake I love how the scripture says he leads us besides calm waters You can't have calm waters while you're being fake. You have calm waters through transparency. He restores my transparent soul. Watch, he loves you. And for me, Philip Anthony Mitchell, the fondest moments of my life is when I'm in my prayer room. No music, no children, no nothing. It's just me and the Father, and I divulge all of my heart before him, and I can feel him sitting there with me. For me, it happens at 4 a.m. every Sunday, 5 a.m. every other day during the week, and it's quiet, and I'm just sitting there with my Father, and I'm just divulging all of my heart before him. For me, it is the most fondest moments of my life. I wouldn't trade those moments for anything 
in this life. And through that type of transparency with God, you will find healing, strength, encouragement, and freedom. Be transparent with your Father. That is my prayer for you. In the name of the one who died to create that access, the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. Amen. We truly hope this message resonated with you and encouraged you in Christ. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please support the spread of the gospel by visiting us online and choosing the giving option that works best for you. And again, thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next week.